So today I'm speaking with Mark Brower from Mark Brower Properties in Mesa, Arizona. Mark currently manages over 600 doors in uh, Mesa, Arizona and the surrounding markets. Um, and he's currently averaging about 20 plus units per month in terms of bringing on uh, new doors under management. Uh, Mark also has extremely high reviews on Yelp and Google. And with a 20% a churn rate, this puts Mark on a path to over a thousand properties over the next coming years. Mark is growing at this rate without any direct ad spend and instead focuses on delivering exceptional value and content creation to grow. So Mark is passionate about helping other property management company owners scale their business and is also forming a new company called Solo, which I'll tell you a little bit about at the end of this uh, talk. So Mark was nice enough to join us today and share his experience building up his property management company from the ground up. So I guess just to get things kicked off, Mark, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, how you got into property management, um, and basically anything you think would be relevant for people to know about you? Absolutely. Stephen, thanks so much for having me as a guest. It's, it was great meeting you at the recent national conference and just super impressed with your organization. And I think we have an alignment of, of some of our ideas and values. So excited to be uh, in this interview with you today. Um, what was your question again? <laughs> just if, if you could share a little bit about how you got into property management yeah, for and sure. your experience. So how I got into property management, uh, I was really deliberate. You know, some of us, some of us fall into this business. I think, you know, we have this term accidental landlord. And sometimes I think there's accidental property managers, right? That, that really good real estate, you know, sales minded individual who ends up, you know, having a few clients that beg them to manage some properties. So that, that's some people's journey. Mine was a little different. I, uh, graduated with a business degree, uh, uh, majored in economics and got an internship at a land brokerage firm in Scottsdale, Arizona with a boutique firm that sold land from farmers to developers and then resold that land to home builders. I was in my 20s. I was making ridiculous money for someone in their 20s. It went all to my head and then the market crashed. And uh, luckily, I had a very humbling experience. Um, I already had two or three kids at the time. This was 2000. Um, this is 2008, 2007, 2008. And I thought, you know, what am I going to do? I started an appraisal management company for a year. I tried a couple different things. I was recruited to start a land div division of a multifamily brokerage in town and just all the deals were falling apart. And I thought, you know, this, this kind of sucks. You know, I have a family with kids and I'm on this roller coaster feast and famine in commercial real estate. And I want to have a stable, predictable cash flow and I want to build something that could live beyond me, that could become an entity unto itself. I'd read, read um, Robert Kiyosaki, super inspiring, you know, rich dad, poor dad. And he talks about how people can move from employee to self-employed and then from self-employed to business owner. And I thought, man, that is such a rare thing to move from self-employed, first of all, to go self-employed anyway, but then go from self-employed to business owner. That's a hard that's a hard corner to turn. And I would want to be in a business that had residual revenue. I would want to be doing something that relates to me, that I understand that I'm passionate about. My wife and I already had five rental properties at this time. And I would want to do something that had easy enough problems to solve that I could build a team around me so that it could become an entity and unto itself. So I was really deliberate. I was thinking insurance or property management. And everybody said, don't do property management. It's a, it is not a glamorous job. You're going to be a punching bag for tenants and owners. And I dove in anyway. Got it. Okay. So I guess you went from the, the mindset of, I want to have a business. And then obviously, how do you go from, I want to have a business to actually creating one? Like what were your, what was kind of your path to getting to your first hundred properties under management? Yeah. hundred. Yeah. Thank you. So, so my economics uh, training from college uh, told me that, you know, find what people are demanding. If I find an unmet need. Don't just go build something to build something. Um, uh, find an unmet need and then satisfy that. Do it a lot better. So I decided I, I'd already experienced poor property management. So it was kind of an easy fit to think, wow, we could do this a lot better. We could manage other clients' properties like we manage our own. So when we finally decided to commit to that, um, I started making phone calls to people I knew, just warm contacts. And I got like five to 10 accounts, like right off the bat. Okay. Um, did, did also have one door or were they 
Did any of them have multiple doors? I think one, one of my clients had three, but he tried me out with one. He's like, I'm not in love with my property manager. I'm going to give you one. Okay. And then, and then, and then I'm going to warn listeners. Don't, don't like shut your ears off when I'm about to say this. I, I posted on Craigslist offering my services and, and that's not a viable strategy anymore. But, but the principle is true because what I was doing is I was just being scrappy any way I could. I made a bunch of phone calls. I posted on Craigslist. I acted like a landlord would act when they're searching on Google. I did all kinds of keyword searches and anything that was not a direct ad for a competitor, like it was a directory or it was a paid lead source or it was next door or anything like that. I was, I, I made it a point to get into that, get on that, figure out how to get myself to the top of that list. So I was posting at Craigslist being super scrappy. I even thought about doing bandit signs at freeway off ramps, never had to resort to that. Yeah. Um, and also calling for rent by owners on Zillow, you know, just doing anything. And I think that if someone's scrappy enough and they're committed enough and they, they're, they know that they're going to, you know, be committed to uh, driving great service to landlords, anybody could hang out a shingle and get to 20 to 30 doors, you know, within, I don't know, six months, a, a year tops. If, if you're just really committed and hustling. Definitely. I think it's, um, it, it's, that's the toughest part though, right? You have to be willing to put yourself out there. And a lot of people don't like to do that. Um, so you mentioned you were calling uh, for rent by owners. How can you explain like a little bit about your experience with that? Because I've had experience myself cold calling when we first started our company, and I know it's not easy. Um, yeah, it does work. So I guess what was your mindset on that? How how did you overcome like the uh, what I imagine is probably constant rejection? Yeah, I don't know. I, I I think I was lucky because back in high school, I was so desperate for money. I um, once I responded to an ad for a telemarketing uh, company. Yeah. So I, it wasn't my first rodeo at just cold calling people. I'd also served a mission for my church for two years, spreading Christianity in a Buddhist nation. So I was used to people um, not uh, wanting what I was, uh, you know, promoting. And so, um, you know, it's just the old adage that you know, every no is getting you one step closer to the next yes. And you have to believe that to your core and you have to just take massive action. I think uh, the, 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 the tragedy of, of, of the fear of failure is that it really slows down our growth, really slows down our learning. So it's just being committed to get pushing through that. Definitely, definitely. I, I know um, when we started, I remember we used to use a trick where we would buy a bag of beets and we would tell ourselves, okay, you, you, you need to like build up the courage and make uh, 50 calls a day. So we'd, we'd have 50 beads. And for each call we'd make, we'd put a bead in the, basically in like a glass jar. So you could see it visually. Okay. I'm getting one step closer to like that. Those 50. Ooh, I like that. Make, so, um, you gave yourself a little dopamine hit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Just little tricks to try and uh, get you to keep going. Um, so I guess. You've obviously come a long way from hitting your first hundred doors. Um, what problems, or, or once you hit one hundred properties under management, how did your problems change? So I imagine at first it was really like, okay, I need to build up a book of business, and then once you hit a hundred doors, you have a little bit more breathing room in the sense, like now you have at least, um, you know, some doors under management, some cash coming in. Like, what was, what were the major shifts you noticed happen after that? Yeah, you know what? I as you asked that question, I'm just reflecting on on one or two other things. If I could digress just a little bit, sure. um, I don't, I don't, sh I haven't shared this a whole lot, but but when I first got started in property management, I partnered with somebody. I partnered with somebody that used their brokerage license and their office as our home base, and um, and pay per click advertising was in its infancy, and we were buying clicks for like five to seven dollars a click. It was amazing. And so that, that was another thing that helped us grow uh, fairly quickly in the beginning. But I, I grew that business up within a year to over 100 doors. And I had some, some people in the office that were doing other real estate things that were able to help out with different functions. And that was really critical. I don't, I, there's no way I would have gotten 100 doors as quickly as we did without you know, some kind of help and support and staff there that was available. Flex time. You know, just kind of being scrappy and like, hey, can you do these tasks for me? And kind of a task economy mindset thinking there's too much for me to do. How do we spread this out? How do we align ourselves with good people that have good work, work ethic that can get these simple things done? That partnership ended. And one day I was actually um, tragically 
uh, I, I had been meeting with that partner saying, hey, you know, I've noticed that this isn't working for me anymore. I'd like to amicably, amicably part ways and split things up and maybe we, we share some accounts or one of us buys the other out. And unfortunately, one day on a Friday morning, I woke up to uh, uh, being locked out of the software. My license had been severed and the locks were changed at the brokerage office. And so uh, I was really kind of in a panic and I had to start all over. And so I just, I don't want, uh, the reason I share that right now is I don't want people to think that that it was just really easy for me. And there was, I mean, we all know that we had adversity, but that was a significant blow to me. We, I hadn't even been making enough money yet to be able to um, afford my lifestyle that I needed, uh, supporting a wife and, and four kids at that time. And so then I had that set back and then I had to just go rapidly get my broker's license, open my own shop. And I was faced with n no revenue and, 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 and I, it was almost like, um, I, so for some reason I have this visual, like, like, you, you know, that, that reaping machine that like that harvests the wheat from the field. I felt like I was running right in front of that thing because I was, I was burning through cash, but I knew that I would, there was no way I would be able to grow fast enough to, to survive if I didn't have some help. So mm -hmm. I, in that first hundred doors, the second time I was building a hundred doors, I actually hired a full-time employee and her name was Terry Rowe and she was amazing. She handled everything. So all I had to do was sell. Okay. And then once we got beyond a hundred doors, then things started breaking down because Terry um, remembered everything that we were doing. She remembered all of our owners, all of our residents, where everything was out in process. We used a couple paper checklists. We used a whiteboard. But those systems started breaking down. So it's like, you know, that analogy of, of business is a machine and a, and a machine can handle a certain load. And then it starts, you know, breaking or you the cracks start forming. Yeah. And it's like we got to like 120, 140 doors and then things just started coming. The wheels started coming off. And in order for us to scale, we had to rebuild the whole machine. But there was there was one other mistake I made at that time that I, I think is important to share. Critical mistake I made is I had I was so desperate for money that I said yes to everything. I think a lot of us have been there when we're brought a business. Definitely. I said yes to a client that had forty seven properties at in, in that first year. I also said yes in my second year in business to a client that had eighty properties. Looking back. Huge mistake because key man risk or I, I essentially became uh, the assistant for those clients in how they wanted their business run. And they were so demanding that I hijacked any cumulative growth. I, I, I basically sidelined all the growth of building that machine for just short term revenue. Those clients eventually left or I fired them and I felt like, man, I just lost two years. Yeah, I just I, mean, I just. Yeah, go ahead. What when you're first starting out, it's it's hard, right? Somebody comes to you and they have 47 properties that that's going to double your business. It, it's very tough to say no, but um I, I would argue in the long run those end up being your worst clients a aside from just being their personal assistant, you have a huge key man risk. All of a sudden you lose that client and, and you've lost 50% of your business. Now your entire life is is kind of like upended, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah, lots of anxiety over that. Yeah, I, I, I hear you on that. That's a, it's a tough situation to be in. So we've learned that lesson. Now at over 600 units, our largest concentration of, of properties is like we have one client that has five. Everybody else has less than that. And so it's just a much more confident position to be in. And I would never go back to, to doing it otherwise. Uh, but, but just answering the question, what else sort of changed or what else shifted after a hundred units, really what ended up happening is I started, I started becoming the bottleneck. Uh, well, you know, and, and honestly, I think the, 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 I, I believe that the founder, the entrepreneur is always the bottleneck. It's either their time is the bottleneck or the way they're thinking is the bottleneck or both. And so what I didn't understand is how to leverage myself further. I didn't understand that I needed knowledge. I didn't know where to get that knowledge because I, I had the presupposition that I always scored really high on standardized tests in elementary school. And even my ACT score was really high. And I, I was, I, I'm, I'm a really smart guy. So this, this belief that I was smart became my biggest liability Yeah, because I didn't reach out for help fast enough. 
I was really just kind of white knuckling it and trying to force all the solutions thinking, no, I should be able to figure this out. Um, and, and then, so what that prevented me from doing is recognizing that I'm not, a am not a systems and a process guy. I I'm smart, but the systems and process I'm going to put together are probably about 15% as good as a collection of eight other people in the industry that have already done this for five years, where if I could just tap into their brains, well, oh, I'm building my machine a lot faster. Yeah. That's, uh, y- you can, you can go much further when you have a lot of great minds combined rather than trying to figure it all out yourself. I know a lot of entrepreneurs have the issue of thinking like I can do it better than anybody else. So I should be the one that does it. But when you have that type of mentality, you end up basically getting, as you said, being the bottleneck in your business. And then because of that, your business can't succeed. Um, basically because of the fact that you're holding it back. Um, so totally. it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky situation to be in. I, I guess when you were hiring people, like what would you say were some of your key hires that really helped spark you to, to get to where you are today, managing over 600 doors and, and growing at over 20 properties uh, per month? Great question. Dan Sullivan wrote the book. In fact, he didn't even write it, but he's credited with the book, Who Not How, right? Somebody else wrote it because that was the who that should have written that book. So um, every problem that we ask ourselves, like, how do I get through this? Let's shift our mindset and think, who already experienced this? Who is the person that can push me through this? And so Terry Rowe for uh, zero to 150 doors was vital. But then I just really sort of bottlenecked and kind of uh, plateaued out for a a few years with taking on bigger clients, hijacked, uh, you know, I allowed myself to be hijacked by. And then um, it wasn't until... I got to a breaking point of around like maybe 180, 200 properties under management when all I had done to that point is just hired assistants. I had this scarcity mindset thinking like, this is what I can afford or I can't even afford this. So I'm going to hire the cheapest labor that I possibly can. All that did is compound my problems. Not only did I not have the right tech stack or the right processes, the right systems, the right owner handbook, the right expectations, the willingness to say no to demanding clients. I didn't have any of that, but I also surrounded myself with really low impact help. And so that really set me back. I think if I go back and do it again, I would have overpaid. I would have found the smartest people I could paid 130% of what I thought my budget should have been, but I would have realized 180% of the impact. So I think opportunity cost, thinking about what we're giving up, instead of looking at costs as dollars flowing out of my bank account, looking at cost is what am I giving up by having this person on my team when I can have a much higher level person on my team, pay them a lot more money I don't have today, but they're going to accelerate me through the next stage of growth yeah. and I'm going to get that money faster. So the next person I hired that was critical uh, is Drip, Richard Shope. He's still with me today, been, been with me eight years, senior operations manager, absolutely could not afford his salary was freaking out, but I realized it took me until I I was feeling like I'm either going to burn myself out and get sick, or I'm going to sell this business and go get a job. I've had it. I'm at my limits. I was working until two in the morning, multiple times a week with that stupid mindset that I've got to do this all. I'm smarter. I can do it better. So Richard came along. I sat down in an interview with him and I actually cried in the interview. I started tearing up and I'm like, man, I just need some help here. And he's like, okay, I'll I'll come help you. That's when you know you've really reached your limit when you're, you're crying, interviewing, uh, a candidate. <laughs> yeah. Pro tip, don't cry. But I think he could tell I was sincere. Somehow it worked out. So I'm super grateful that he came on. Awesome. And were there any other key hires along the way? So after the, like, Absolutely. imagine once you get 300, 400 yeah. properties, there's other positions. Yeah. I, I, I watched this YouTube video. This guy, I think is CEO in a Bentley. Uh, this guy is a really smart guy. And he says, he said, from zero to million dollars in revenue, you're looking for product market fit. You're just trying to figure out who you are, what you do different or better than anybody else. Get that message out. Say no to the wrong fit. You're just trying to figure that out, right? Yeah. But after you get to a million, from a million to 10 million, it has everything to do with the people that you're able to recruit, enroll in your vision, empower them, and move things forward. And so after Rich came on, eventually we crossed a million in revenue. And, and I was really slow to the dance on this one too. Eventually, I hired a business development manager. So, so Mark Brower Properties before my operations manager, th- this growth path, uh, operations manager comes on, we're at this growth path. 
eventually I had the confidence to hire a business development manager and, and offload that from my plate. And then we started doing this. Yeah. And so those are the, those are the, I would say those are the big rock, most important hires okay. that we, Got it. that we experience. Got it. And I guess when you hire people, um, what KPIs do you keep track of to make sure that that new hire was worth it or that a new hire is, is, you know, helping you accomplish the goals that you set out for the business? Yeah. Um, I'm going to admit that that is not my strong suit. KPIs are not my strong suit. I'm the big picture, like cheerleader guy, like, yeah, we can do this and you're smart and I appreciate you so much. Um, I am not looking at KPIs like I should. So that, that actually connects with the last idea that we just talked about. So recently, just this year, um, I formed a partnership with a gentleman that's an absolute genius um, in this uh, industry, has scaled multiple property management companies rapidly with eight figure exits. And he is, you know, the yang to my yang or the yin to my yang. He's, yeah. he's, so he is like super dialed in with KPIs and metrics. In fact, we've got a, a 75 inch flat screen on the wall out in the, in the main area of the office now that just rotates screens that shows units added, units lost, uh, CSAT, customer uh, satisfaction, NPS, net promoter score. It's showing how fast we do things. I think metrics really fall into two main buckets. How fast are you doing the stuff that you promise to do and how happy are people about it? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, those are the two things. And so um, there's another really great book called The One Thing. Yeah. And um, well, the one thing is like, what's the one thing in my business I need to focus on right now that either makes everything become easier or irrelevant? And for us, uh, a part of this year, what our focus was is... Um, the one thing is communication responsiveness. If you can answer 95% of incoming calls with an intelligent, enthusiastic person, that, that, that changes a lot. And if you can get email responses, acknowledge emails within an hour and then resolve within 24, you know, one business day, that's tremendous. That yeah. one thing alone. Um, so, so that those are metrics that I'm, I'm concerned with is the really big picture stuff. Got it. I mean, from, from just speaking with you for the last 20 minutes, it, it sounds like you've learned something along the way that I think a lot of business owners would basically would be good to, to listen to is you realize what your strengths are and then you went out and found people that are good at what your weaknesses were so that you could just focus on your strengths and really by combining, you know, people that are strong at areas you're weak, you were able to really catapult your growth and get to where you're at now. Is that... Would you, would you agree with that? 100% business, business is a team event. It's a, it's a team exercise. Yeah. And, and if you think that I can hold up your Atlas, you've got the world on your shoulders. You think that's going to be your best outcome? hundred percent wrong. It took me years to learn that. Now that I've learned that all I'm doing is thinking about Who's better at this, or who, how do I re, how do I get eighty percent of the tasks that are on my plate off my plate, so I can stay in my unique ability? You're, it's a, just to use the economic term, going back to my economic roots. It's the competitive advantage. So, in other words, building teams that maximize each individual person's competitive advantage, it gets a huge multiplier effect, and that's how we should be thinking about growing business. Yep, no, I agree, hundred um, percent. I guess to to shift gears a little bit. You're in a competitive market, right? Phoenix metro area. Um, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of property management companies. How were you able to differentiate yourself to stand out from those, you know, hundreds or, or thousands of property management companies? Because you're, you know, you're just one fish in, in the entire sea. Um, what what is it that really gets you to be able to convince somebody to work with you versus one of the other hundreds of options they might have? You know, I think we're really lucky, Stephen. Yeah, a few thoughts flood into my mind. Number one, Alex Hermosi uh, has a famous quote I want to circle back to, but I think we're really lucky in that we end up actually interviewing and qualifying the prospect as much as they're interviewing and qualifying us. We have this philosophy that, hey, we really know who we are. We really know what we do. We're good people. We're committed to only good profits. We don't want to leverage and abuse our our, our, our unique position and, and apply our creativity of how we can be max everyone to death. We're that's not, that's not in our cloth or we're not cut from that cloth. So 
So we really and, and truly want to add value. So let's get really clear about who we're a fit for and who we're not a fit for and get that out there on our website, get that out there right in the beginning of all sales calls so that the people that um, that resonate with 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 what we do and who we are, it's just a, it's just an obvious fit. And we're a premium service provider. Our lowest fee plan is at least double what our biggest uh, competitor in this market is uh, is charging. So it's really through like brand messaging and being super clear on who your prospect is and who you're a good fit for and who you're not. Yeah, I think. I mean, that, that doesn't seem like if you'd told me that 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to draw a direct line between like really strong, healthy, profitable growth and just being really clear about who to say no to. But in a way, it's kind of it's kind of that thing. And Alex Hormozzi says, I'm going to botch this, but you can look it up. He says, if you do something uncommon for an, uh, you do something common or you do something well for an uncommonly long period of time without stopping, success is inevitable. So I think the other thing is we are, we're just committed to the long run. I'm going to be in this business for another 30 years. And so we're just getting started. I think that um, if you have that kind of a long-term mindset, um, you're unstoppable. If you've got good values, you understand how to surround yourself with people that have strengths that you don't have. By the way, side comment on that. I think entrepreneurship is the absolute best job that could possibly exist because as we experience more success, we hire more people that do more of the stuff that we can't stand to do that drains our energy. And all we're left with is what we're super passionate about, yeah. what just flows through us, that comes naturally, and that is hugely valuable to other people. So I love it. I feel I feel lucky every day. Yeah. I think um, he also says you need to think in decades, not years, right? Um, mm -hmm. So that that's just you know adding to your point of, of exactly what your mindset is. That's the way you need to think about it. You can't think of okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to produce this piece of content. Hopefully next month it brings in some leads. That that might only start to work in five years from now. Right. You know that if, again, if you continue doing the same thing for a very long period of time, eventually it's going to start to pay off. I think once you start thinking in decades, you stop worrying so much about hacks and tactics and you start focusing on fundamentally uh, being a smart good person and providing as much value and just trusting that that's going to trickle out there and, and you're going to get recognized for that and it's going to compound eventually. And it does. A hundred percent. I'd say the overwhelming commonality between all the property management companies we work with that are in the 500 plus door range or thousand plus door range is they have that long-term mindset that, you know, it's, it's funny, but it's, it's usually the people that are earlier in the game, let's say, that are, are under 100 doors, under 200 properties under management that are looking for that, you know, kind of quick gimmick that's going to help explode their business. But it really doesn't work like that. Um, it no. really is a long-term game. And that's not just for property management. That's all businesses, um, to be honest. But, you know, especially in property management where you're building up recurring revenue, it takes time, but eventually it does start to pay off. We, I mean, we have compassion for the 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 new the new founder that that's maybe looking for those quick fixes because uh, you know one way I look at this you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs right so like psychology one hundred and one like the reason uh, the reason we start our business initially and the reason it was really motivating us is we got to eat you know and so, so we're we're saying yes to everything and we don't want to take on debt. And we're, we're nervous that, you know, you know, so and then after, so, so maybe the primary driver was I got to eat and I don't want to work for somebody else, you know? And then the next level up is something like, um, Hey, I don't, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to have ulcers and, and die early. I, I'm eating now. So I, now I want to do, you know, something that, you know, that's a little bit less stressful. Right. And then eventually when we get to the top, we're like, Hey, you know what? I've already achieved time and financial freedom, but I am, I'm so excited about continue to grow this business because it's a manifestation of who I am mm -hmm. and I'm self-actualizing and I'm helping other people self-actualize through it. And that's a beautiful place to be. And it's super exciting. Yep. For sure. I guess, um, for like talking of, of people in the earlier stage of their business, would you recommend positioning your property management company in the major metro market? So for example, you guys are in Mesa, Arizona. 
but you do mm-hmm. service Phoenix Metro. When you were just starting out, did you try to go after the metro area as a whole, or no. do you recommend focusing more on like surrounding markets and making a name for no. yourself there? I think it's a mistake to go after a huge area. Like I, I'm sure people have done it successfully, but I think it's a mistake. I, I feel like I feel like what we have to do is be aware of uh, a, a, a density and the the efficiencies that can be achieved through a density, uh, both from an operations standpoint and from a sales and marketing standpoint, mm-hmm. right? So um, we started in just a, a, a part of the valley. We only just, after hitting over 500 doors, we only just opened it up to the entire market, you know, recently in the last year, year and a half. So, so I, think, I think that's another thing that's really difficult, right? Because if you commit to just servicing a smaller area, then you actually have to commit to saying no to something right outside that area. And when you're yeah. a new company, then it's so hard to do. You have to, it's such an act of faith to say, when I say no to this, I'm going to make more money. Definitely. Definitely. Especially when, uh, as you said before, like at this point, you're just trying to think of how do I provide for my basic needs? Um, so it, it's definitely tough. And uh, I understand that we've, I think we've both been there where, yep. uh, you know, they're, they're trying to give me money. I need to take it. Yeah. Um, but in the long run, yeah, it's tough to build a, a, a machine that way. Um, yeah. So definitely. I, I guess- over the course of your business, what have you found to be your best source for leads in terms of, of attributing to your growth? I feel like the lead sources um, changed a bit in the first few years that I was in business. You know, we, I, I feel like marketing is a never-ending experiment, right? Like we, we're trying different things. We're, uh, but but eventually, now that we're a little bit more mature, I feel like. Um, the reputation, the, that compounding effect, that cumulative effect of you mentioned in the beginning of this interview, the Yelp profile we have, people that, that you know, find a lot of high credibility and Yelp reviews, we convert them at a very high rate. It's a, it's astonishing. And there's a, and, and it's a huge competitive advantage for us because there's a lot of property managers that think, oh, Yelp Schmelp, you know, it's a scam. You got to pay them. And then they get rid of your bad reviews. Not true. Yeah. We've paid them over the years and they have never moved great reviews from our back page to our front page or put, you know, bad reviews from our front page. We have, it never worked for us. We asked them because we were reading the same, the same thing. How many people making these comments? So, so bottom line is if, if you're willing to take extreme ownership of your business in a way that anytime somebody's upset for any reason, you own it a hundred percent, you put it on the table and you say, where did our process fail? And they get so committed to fixing that part of the process, setting better expectations, even if it means going back to the beginning of the relationship and saying, you know what, we should have um, qualified this prospect better and never worked with them. At some point, you can own every upset to every inter- every um, you know stressful interaction you have. So I'm getting off off topic a little bit, but um, so for us now, it's a lot uh, referrals, a lot of reputation. Pay-per-click advertising is insanely expensive in the Phoenix metro area. It is. And so- uh, It's getting increasingly more expensive as well. It's crazy. There's 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 large tech companies, now that they're our primary competitors, there's large tech companies that their cost of new client acquisition, they're willing to spend up to $3,000, yeah. $3,500. Why? Because they don't have to be profitable. You know, they're raising exactly. millions of dollars to build a better- owner portal and all they have to do is show that they're acquiring clients yeah that, that's a completely different business model though and you don't you know yeah. as a as a local property management company doesn't make sense to try and play their game um not you're at all lose, and you're gonna lose every time not at all here's why the future is bright i know you didn't ask me this question but here's why the future is very bright for the small property manager my premise is it is impossible to replicate or replace the high trust relationship that that must exist between the single property owner, landlord investor, and their local property manager. You can't spend enough millions on technology to replace that connection. I agree. I agree. I think um, for for most people that own a rental property, they want to be able to speak with somebody that is local, that that you know, that, that understands the market. Um, whereas a lot of these big tech companies, they might have like one property manager for the entire state. 
Yeah. Um, and like we, we see it time and time again. They don't even live in the state. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, I guess if you were able to go back in time to when you started your business, what's the one thing you would change that would have the biggest impact on helping you succeed at a faster pace? Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is I would have surrounded myself with smart people that had already been there way earlier. I spent too many years as an island just kind of trying to figure it out because I was smart. Um, one of the things that changed everything for me is a guy in my market named Tim. Uh, you you know Tim. Okay. He he invited me out for lunch to acquire my business. And it, in some at some point that lunch, he mentioned entrepreneur organization, EO. And so I looked up EO and joined their accelerator group, which put me into mastermind groups monthly, all day quarterly learning events, and a whole bunch of access to really smart people that were committed to helping each other's businesses grow and flourish. And, and that changed everything. So I feel like, if, you know, like, like we are the bottleneck with the entrepreneur, the founder, we're the bottleneck in, in the, in the, in the fastest way that we can remove ourselves from being the bottleneck is to change our thinking. It's not the problem that's the problem. It's the way we're thinking about the problem that's the real problem. And so surrounding myself, the, 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 you know, the old adage of you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? Yeah. Who are you hanging out with? You're hanging out with you and your assistants or are you hanging out with other really smart entrepreneurs that have already been where you were and they're five steps ahead? Yeah. That accelerates things. Uh, I think um, a lot of people make the mistake of trying to figure things out themselves. When there are so many resources out there, you can go and pay somebody that's already been or, or that's already at where you want to be. And you can accelerate your growth that much quicker because of 100%. And the reason we don't do that is because we're thinking of cost the wrong way. Yeah. We're thinking of cost as dollars leaving our bank account. And I can't afford that. It's a scarcity mindset. It's fear-based. If we looked at it as an opportunity cost foregone, that, that if I don't spend this money, if I don't access uh, more intelligent wisdom and talent and and, and uh, knowledge, then I'm leaving a half million dollars of profit on the table that I could have two years from now instead of four years from now, five years from now. If we start, if we start bringing that pain to the present of opportunity cost, um, I, we'll, it will make decisions differently. Agreed. Agreed. I appreciate all the advice you've shared with us today. Um, I guess just before I let you go, if anyone wants to learn more about you or connect with you, what would be the best way for them to do so? Absolutely. Look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, look us up on Facebook, Mark Brower Properties. We're rebranding the company to Mark Rent. So we're rolling that out, out here within the next month. Um, also, uh, just a little plug for uh, the new company Solo that I'm launching with my partner. Solo is uh, basically the premise is the future of property management is the solopreneur property manager. And instead of big tech companies taking over our industry, really what's going to happen is if, if someone can effectively empower the solopreneur to not max out at 30 to 50 units, to gain the knowledge centers, the community, the coaching, the mentorship, but also have a partner that does some of their easy repetitive tasks month in, month out. And I'm not talking just about a, a virtual assistant that you need to like put a whole system in place for them to be productive. We've already put the system together. We hire the labor. We manage the labor. Things just get done. So you manage relationships and you manage the growth of your business. So if that sounds interesting to anybody. We think what we're going to do is shave off three to five years of the learning curve and let people accelerate their business growth a lot faster. Oh, that sounds great. Anyone that's listening and you're in that stage, I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, as I said before, you can go so much quicker by leveraging people around you rather than trying to figure everything out by yourself. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate your time and uh, we'll speak soon. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Stephen. If you enjoyed today's video, please give us a like, hit that subscribe button so we know to continue producing great content that'll help you grow your property management company. Also, be sure to check out our website, upkeepmedia.com. Head on over to our growth marketing session page at upkeepmedia.com slash growth Sign up for a growth marketing session where we'll walk you through what your competitors are doing to bring on new properties to manage, what you can do to better position yourself and bring on new doors to manage as well. Thanks. See you in the next video.